Thank you. Uh, I am not just uh, new to high tech, but I'm a technophobe. So I am somebody who doesn't really understand technology. I live in the Bay Area. I've lived in San Francisco for 32 years and in the San Francisco Bay Area for 38 years. Um, so I'm going to tell you what it's like to be a technophobe and then join a tech company at age 52, which was <laughs> sort of a revelation for me. Um, I'm honored to be here, uh, big fan of what you're doing, uh, big fan of Danny. Uh, Danny's going to be speaking at our Airbnb Open uh, in uh, Los Angeles in November. So let me get, tell you a little bit of my story. Lauren did a great job of giving you some history. I have been a boutique hotelier for 30 years. So I, I was a disruptor as a boutique hotelier, and then I got disrupted by the Expedias and Pricelines of the world in the, in the uh, dot-com bus, and then now I'm a disruptor again. And I will tell you, it's a lot more fun being a disruptor than being a disrupted. Um, so in early 2013, I got a call from a guy named Brian Chesky. He's one of the three co-founders of Airbnb. And he said to me, um, the three of us founders want to meet you, um, and we want to talk to you about Airbnb. And I said to him, isn't that the company that Couchsurfing owns? <laughs> Which was a really bad thing to say to the co-founder of Airbnb. I didn't really understand Airbnb, to be honest with you. I was a whole hotelier who had blinders on. Uh, I had heard about it. It's a San Francisco company. It was growing quickly. But as is true of many hoteliers, I didn't see it necessarily as a competitive threat. Um, and I didn't really understand it. And frankly, in early 2013, when he reached out to me, I did not have an Uber or a Lyft app on my phone either. So that shows, really, just three and a half years ago where we've come, at least where I've come from. Um, so the thing, I sat down with the three founders, and they said to me, uh, sort of like what I think Steve Jobs said to John Scully long ago, he, he said to me, how would you like to democratize hospitality? Mm -hmm. Now, I liked that. I really thought that the idea of the hotel industry, quite specifically, has gotten more and more corporatized over time. Uh, if you look at many of the ho best hotels here in New York, San Francisco, and other cities, they used to be owned by families that owned them and almost were like the crown jewel of the family. And then they got sold to private equity firms, which is nothing wrong with private equity firms. They're private equity people in the room, I'm sure, here today. But what happened was something got lost. I used to think of the hospitality business as big H, small b. And over time, it felt a little bit more like it was small h, big b, and that's part of the reason I sold my company, Joie de Vivre, um, uh, six years ago. So the idea of democratizing hospitality sounded great. And then they also said, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do it with all these hosts around the world, and you're going to be in charge of figuring out how to help us offer a service and an experience and hospitality in such a way that we actually exceed the customer satisfaction of hotels. Now, that was a riddle that was really made me curious, like how can we do this without people who aren't our employees? So I'm going to talk about that in my talk. So I'm going to give you a, a talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for about 10, 10 or 12 minutes of questions, all right? So here's the first problem. Not only did I not understand Airbnb, but I was a Bay Area person who had never worked in a tech company. I was a bit of a technophobe, and, and the idea of being in a company where the, the ethos is I code, therefore I am, yeah. didn't fit for me. In fact, my first week on the job, I was sitting in a meeting, and an engineer said something that was quite philosophical, but I didn't quite get it. He said, if you ship a product, if you ship a feature, and nobody uses it, did it really ship? <laughs> I, at the end of the week, I said to my friend, I'm in deep ship, because I don't know what it means to ship product or ship features. I've never heard this language. I didn't know what they were talking about. So quite quickly, I realized I was surrounded by people who were half my age. And I was now reporting, after 24 years of being CEO of my own company, 3,500 employees, I was now reporting to Brian, who was 21 years younger than me, who wanted me to be his mentor. He said, I'm, we're, I'm bringing you on board because we have nobody in the hotel industry in the company. We have nobody in hospitality in the company. But um, w after that first week, I realized I was both the mentor and the intern. And that's really been my experience. I call myself a modern elder. Because I think modern elders are different than traditional elders. Traditional elders had all the wisdom, and wisdom flew, flowed downhill. And I, frankly, the wisdom in this company is symbiotic. Me and the millennials, back and forth. Um, so here are the five things I, say, I would say that I've learned at Airbnb as someone who comes from the high-touch world and now understands the ena enabling technology uh, that can allow for better hospitality. 
Number one is, has nothing to do with uh, technology. It really actually goes back to why boutique hotels became so popular starting about 30 years ago. And that is people want to live like a local. Now what you will see, we're going to announce something uh, with Airbnb in November. Um, it'll be our biggest announcement ever. Uh, I can't tell you what it is. But it will speak to this idea of how do we use technology to help you understand uh, your local experiences. Um, and so long story short is, I do think what's very clear is that um, I'm a big fan of Abe Maslow, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, five levels of the pyramid. I, I would take Maslow's pyramid and turn it into a three-level pyramid, survival, succeed, transform. The hotel industry for many, many years sort of thought of hotel guests as people who needed predictability and consistency, and that's all they needed. It was almost like they were stuck at the bottom of the pyramid. The basic physiological safety needs and making sure all the the hardware of the hotel was well cared for. And when I say hardware, I mean really just the physical product. Um, they didn't really give a lot of attention to the software, the human side. And they definitely didn't give a lot of attention to the higher needs of guests. Uh, I think boutique hotels did that in a huge way, starting about 30 years ago. And Airbnb just took that further. If you want to live like a local, you can actually live in a residential neighborhood somewhere, anywhere in the world, 34,000 cities. So I think that's my first lesson. But that's not very technology focused. The second one is, though, the idea that um, at Airbnb, we optimize for digital, but foremost, in the past year and a half, we optimize for mobile. And so, I don't know, I can't tell you how many, I'm on three different boards, and I've, I still own a lot of hotels. I, I sold the management company and the brand, but I still own about 14 hotels. Most of the hospitality optimizes for laptops still. And then when you have the digital experience in mobile, it ain't very good. And I got to tell you, for a year and a half now, I've hated the presentations at Airbnb, but the presentations, everything we see now is on mobile when we're actually looking at, at uh, the variety of different designs we're looking at. It's not as fun, frankly, looking at it on mobile on a big screen because you don't have as much space to work with. But it is the experience that more and more people use when they're actually accessing technology to use your product. And so I think more and more companies need to figure that out and realize that uh, optimizing your design for a laptop or a desktop when in fact people are going to be using it primarily in a mobile format is a mistake. And I don't know about your numbers, but our numbers show at this point that almost half or more than half of our uh, guests and hosts are using our product in a mobile format. And that's just going higher. Thirdly, and this actually answers the riddle I talked about at the start. And this is actually, if there's one thing I can actually I can say today that I want you to take with you and go and innovate around, this is it. The thing that Airbnb has done exceptionally well, beyond creating a nice design and creating an environment where the currency is trust, people feel trust, it's a trusted platform, is we have created a feedback loop that has created better, a better experience. So let me explain that for a moment. First of all, in the hotel industry, let's start by saying, it's, probably, it's pretty embarrassing that the hotel industry decided to outsource the feedback loop to TripAdvisor. <laughs> we, we didn't want to in the hotel industry, but TripAdvisor sort of came in, and that's where people go give their feedback. Uh, on the average hotel company gets between 2 and 10% of its guests uh, filling out an online survey about their experience after they've stayed there. 2 to 10%. So very few people do it. And then when it goes to Bethesda, Maryland, to, Mar to Marriott headquarters, and I love Marriott, so I'm not saying this to beat them up, but this is true of all of them. It goes to Marriott headquarters, they tabulate it, they send it back to the general manager of the hotel, and then often the general manager doesn't actually pass on the information to the staff. Or they do, they'll just show some basic graphs that show a trend line. But it's usually not personalized to any staff. In fact, most guest satisfaction forms don't give you the opportunity to say who on the staff was a star. You know, what, what was, it, was it a housekeeper? Was it a night auditor? Was it a bartender? Was it someone at the front desk? I call our hosts and hotel, our people at the front desk at hotels hosts, which is really ironic because that's what Airbnb is all about, is hosts. For 30 years, I've been using the word host instead of front desk clerk. Because you don't want a clerk when you go to a hotel. You want a host. So long story short is, that is the feedback loop that the, ho the hotel industry has. And the average employee in a hotel in the United States stays in their job nine months. How often do we do performance reviews? One year. Do the math. <laughs> do we have a performance loop to give performance to people 
in a, in, a, in a timely manner so they can get better at what they do? No. So the hotel industry has, hasn't figured that out. Airbnb, 70 to 75% of our hosts and guests review each other. And when I joined uh, three and a half years ago, one of the first things I did was to try to fix that system. The system had some broken parts to it. And it was a good system, but it was not a great system. So we changed a bunch of things, made it uh, more candid so people could feel more comfortable to actually leave the review, gave them 14 days instead of 30 days. Um, and 75%, 70 to 75% now of our hosts and guests review each other. So within 14 days, a host gets feedback that's actionable, that they can actually take action on, and that actually has a huge impact on their, um, their search rankings. So the idea that you can create a feedback loop so people in the hotel industry, the restaurant industry, hospitality, can understand how they did relatively soon after they did it, I mean, it's the difference between why I took an Uber here versus taking a cab. So long story short is that feedback loop in the service industry and in, especially in the hospitality industry um, is not effective currently, generally, in the broader industry. And I think you know, the restaurant industry does have the, the capacity to have tips. But you know, as lots of us have said, I don't think that the tip format is, the, uh, is necessarily a fair format or all that accurate in terms of whether a person had a good experience or not. So we need to figure that one out. Because people deserve more real-time feedback um, if they're actually doing their work. Because the truth is, the more you feel the work you do has an impact, the more engaged you are. Makes sense. All right, fourth, also technology-focused lesson, is with time, everybody out there as a customer is going to feel like they want more, a more personalized and customized experience. Now, what do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean Spotify, Netflix, and Amazon. Those are the models for how you can, over time, once you understand someone's data and you understand their preferences and their tastes and what they like and they don't like, you can customize the experience for them. Now, this is uh, something that makes logical sense. The practicality of how you do it is not, not simple. Fortunately for Airbnb, we are a data company. And we have a lot of people on the in the company who are data scientists. And for any hoteliers here at all, I know it's probably more technology and restaurant people, but it, back, back 20 years, 25 years ago, people couldn't understand why we would want a revenue manager. So the revenue manager in a hotel is the person who decides the pricing. You know, because in a hotel, it's like an airline. The pricing changes day to day um, and at different kinds of parts of the hotel. Well, revenue managers didn't exist 25 years ago because we didn't have very sophisticated distribution systems like we do now in terms of how you're actually distributing your pricing and your product. Similarly, today, if you look forward, if a hotel company doesn't have a lot of data scientists, like they don't have a lot of revenue managers, they're not going to be able to properly understand the customers they have coming in. And over time, customers are going to expect more and more that you can personalize and customize for them. So what does that mean in the context of Airbnb? It means that if we have 90,000 homes now in, in Paris, that is a true statement. Airbnb has 90,000 homes in Paris. That's a paradox of choice. If you actually have 90,000 choices, wouldn't it be nice if you've used us a little bit that we can customize the 12 to 24 that are right for you? Well, we can already st we're already starting to do that. But wouldn't it also be interesting if we knew a little bit about you, that you're going to Paris and you're going there October 1st through 8th, we know that you love art and architecture and jazz, you're a vegetarian, you do yoga, and you like French wine. What if we could actually take that information and help create a little bit of an itinerary for you? Or help to understand how you can unlock Paris in a way that you hadn't, locked, you hadn't been able to do on your own? So that's why data is important. Personalization, customization is important. Data science is essential. You can't do what I just described without great data science. Unfortunately for the Marriott's of the world, or the, well, let's, be, let's pick on Hilton this time. Um, if you stayed in the Hilton one time, and a Conrad, another one of their brands, another time, and a Hampton Inn another time, and then a Hilton Garden, the data you get from that is pretty limited. It just, you just know that the person stayed in that kind of hotel, so maybe it may say, may say something about what location preferences they have or pricing preferences, but nothing more than that. And then if they actually don't fill out their guest satisfaction survey to tell you whether they liked it or not, you don't know that. So these are the key things. We need to be more data centric. And then the data scientists are the magicians who tell you how you can use that information in a way that serves your guests really well. Fifth lesson I had, 
uh, in my, my time in the last three and a half years at Airbnb is there is a growing segment of people in the population that are sort of invisible uh, to a lot of people, but the data is starting, the, the um, macroeconomic data is starting to show that they exist. We call them digital nomads. And these are people, um, generally speaking, who are 40 and younger, but it's people of all ages. There's a couple people, named, we call them our senior nomads um, in Airbnb who got profiled uh, a year and a half ago in the New York Times, where they're basically not, they're living on the road. They are choosing to, the digital nomads are able to do that because they're freelancers and they are able to work wherever they want because as long as they've got a mobile device or a laptop, they can do that. But the 59-year-old and 69-year-old, the, uh, the, the senior nomads, the Campbells, they do it per, for lifestyle choice. This is, their, this is their way of retiring, is to be able to just go around the world. The problem with this is that we have not created a product in the hospitality industry that addresses the digital nomad. Now, most hotels, so I'm a hotelier still, and I believe hotels are not going to get disrupted in a major way by Airbnb, because the basic fundamental aspect of what makes a hotel great, and I love hotels, is it's an efficient way to go from one place to the other, have services provided, have 24-hour desk. That we will never, Airbnb will never be able to keep up with that. So for a two or three night stay, it's perfect, but you're staying for a week to three months. What do you do? If you're staying for a year, you get a year-long lease. But if you're staying for a week to three months, yes, there are some choices out there. There are some extended stay hotels that are basically two rooms instead of one. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of what the product is. Um, and there are some corporate apartments that are incredibly boring and generally in corporate campus locations and not in residential neighborhoods. So I think there's a growing segment of the population who are more and more mobile. And yet we have not caught up as a hospitality industry with creating a product that meets that guest's needs who's staying from a week to three months. Data point here in New York is that 58% of our room nights in New York, in the five borough area, for guests on Airbnb, are people staying a week or longer. So that's a much longer stay than the average length of stay in a hotel. So let me just sum up and open it up for Q&A and just say, the thing that scares me for the hospitality industry is you, people get so caught up in the gadgets that they forget about the human connection. We may have a concierge that's an app. We may not have to check in at the front desk because my mobile phone allows me to go straight to my room. And then when I'm in my room, we may find that there's a robot who's my cleaner in my room. And then the way I go out and do a sightseeing tour is I have an Oculus Rift VR virtual reality that I strap on. And basically, I could have a hospitality experience with no human connection. But I think the beauty of technology, and I think that's the beauty of what Airbnb has done, is to use technology to enable and enhance human connection. And that's really what, that, what the marriage of, to me, of hospitality and technology is when that's done so seamlessly and so beautifully that actually it creates better human connection. So that's my manifesto for the morning. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to open it up now and see if anybody has any questions um, or comments. And, and if you could just keep it brief, we'll only have about 10 or 12 minutes. So. Um, uh, and I'll just call on you. And there's, I think there's somebody with a, a mic, correct? Come on up this way. There's a few people over here, and, and we'll, uh, let's, we'll start with you. And let's wait, let's wait for the, the mic, if you don't mind. And if you could stand up and give us your name. My name is uh, Eric Zambrano. I work at Applico, a platform innovation company here in the city. Um, my question is, do you ever see Airbnb partnering up with the hotel industry? Well, we are starting to partner up in terms of marketing destinations with uh, the hotel industry and what are called DMOs, destination marketing organizations. So we can promote a city in context, in, in, in uh, concert and collaboration with the hotel industry. Um, I'm going to give you a no comment on that one. Um, beyond that, because we, yes, I think that there's some ways that we can collaborate, and we've had really good conversations with the hotel industry, but especially small and localized hotels. I mean, I think that's, you know, those, those are the ones that sort of fit our platform better than, you know, a big gigantic convention hotel. Uh, right behind you, um, right there. 
high Pam Dillon wine ring preference technology for the wine industry, sensory consumer products. My question uh, is in the context of a statement, first of all, there's only one thing that brings people together faster than technology, and that is food and wine. Can you give me a sense of how Airbnb is approaching food and wine, particularly the wine industry, to bring people together in the context of the experiences that you're imagining? Yes. Um, I, what I can say is that uh, we've done very little today. Um, but when you've got a city like, let's like use Paris, where we've got maybe 20,000 people uh, staying there on any particular night, um, it does give you the opportunity to say, what are we doing if people aren't going to be cooking in their own home? Um, what we really love is the idea that people are um, going, and, uh, uh, going to local neighborhood restaurants. Because that's one of, one of our great benefits is that there are neighborhoods that generally don't have hospitality or hotels, and we can actually help to support the local merchants. But it would be nice to spend more and more time where we can actually gr bring our people together uh, and actually give them the opportunity to dine with each other. Uh, and so you'll be hearing more about that in the future. I can't talk about it right now, but I think the idea of that makes a lot of sense. Because actually people on the road, uh, especially if they're staying in a home as opposed to a hotel, there is the possibility of loneliness uh, because you want to actually connect with other people. So um, I want to make sure I look at it. It's great here. Hi. Um, I'm Hallie Meyer. I'm a co-founder. Good You're to meet you, the Chip. Airbnb open also. I'm so looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm co-founder at Umi Kitchen, a home cooked meal delivery service. One of my questions is, how do you continue to incentivize your hosts, um, maybe through the feedback loop, but also yeah. otherwise, uh, to Absolutely. create those experiences for their guests? So. Uh, how do we incentivize our hosts? So first of all, one of the things I did when I joined was, uh, when I did, oh, what I didn't tell you is that the NPS score, so we use Net Promoter Score as our means of determining how we're doing. Um, are, you familiar, are you familiar with Net Promoter Score? If you're not, it, we ask a question, it's a question that came from Bain and Company, you ask a question, would you, um, on a one to 10, how, how would you uh, recommend this to your friends or family? Uh, and our score on NPS now is 50% higher than the global hotel industry. 50% higher. So there's global hotel industries at a 48. Um, you can have a negative score, so just don't worry about, you know, 48 sounds really low. You could have a negative score. Some industries do. 48 for the hotel industry, we're at 72. So why is that? It's partly because we created hospitality standards three and a half years ago based upon what we saw people uh, liked and didn't like. What were the moments of truth, the hospitality moments of truth for our guests? And then we created the standards, and then we actually started holding our hosts accountable and educating them around that, which led us to creating the super host program. So we have about 8% of our hosts globally now who are our super hosts. Um, they get special benefits from that. They get better priority uh, in terms of the um, search results, uh, as well as they, um, you know, they, 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 there are a variety of things that they get that help them to actually um, make more money by doing that, by, by being a super host and, and feeling the intrinsic benefit of actually being good at what they do. But beyond that, so be, beyond the standards that allowed us to actually take tens of thousands of hosts per month off the platform, which is what we do now. So it's a much more quality-focused platform. And then uh, giving incentive to our best hosts. I think the best thing, like the Airbnb Open that you're coming to, for those of you who have an Airbnb account, how many, this is an interesting question, how many of you have an account as a host or as a guest? Oh my god. Well, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> So anybody who raised your hand or anybody who wants it, you can come to the Airbnb Open. Because actually we moved it from just being a host uh, conference the last, first two years to being a, a uh, hosting festival but inviting guests as well. So if you want to sort of understand what goes on at Airbnb, it's November 17th through 19th in uh, downtown LA. So that event where we have over 100 countries of hosts and guests show up, we'll have 20,000 people over three days, we'll have 7,000 for the core, uh, of the programming is such an opportunity for people to actually share best practices with, with each other. And then we elevate some of these hosts so they really feel like they're, you know, the super, not, they're beyond super hosts. They're sort of our role models. Uh, and we've even started working with some of them to license the Airbnb name so they can actually go out and train people themselves. So it's more than anything, it goes back to psychology uh, and it's sort of the carrot and the stick. Um, but we try to use the carrot more than the stick, but the stick was essential, and it's continuing to be essential for us to continue to improve the quality. Um, you had a question right there. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Nancy Vaught, and I manage digital marketing for Fairmont Hotels. Ah. So, um, yep. So, I have a, a question for you in terms of you described really wonderfully what it was like to come into Airbnb from your background and you know being the modern elder, as you said. But what was the biggest challenge going into that group of these you know young technology um, you know individuals that that built Airbnb? What was the biggest challenge you had explaining to them something that was actually very valuable for them to learn about the hotel industry? So I learned very quickly that the best thing I can do is to mentor privately and intern publicly. So what that meant is, okay, so I'm older, than, you know, twice the age of the average person there. Yes, I was a CEO for a long time in the Bay Area, a little bit of a, you know, well, moderately well known. So the last thing I needed to do was to come in and just use that to just tell people this is the way you do it. So what I tried to do in, um, in meetings was to have a beginner's mind. So I, this is, I'm gonna get to your answer here, but within meetings, I had a beginner's mind. I asked a lot of what, if, and why questions. So that was my thing. It's like, what if and why? And there were blind spots that I was able to see in the company because I'm a hotelier and a hospitality person. But I didn't come from the place of assuming things. I came from the place of like, I'm a four-year-old kid. Four-year-old kids ask a lot of why and what if questions and have sort of a beginner's mind. And then in cases where I actually needed to really sort of tell people I think they were wrong, I did all of that privately. I would never, never do it in the meeting because nobody wants to be scolded by someone the age of their father in a meeting. Um, so I think more than anything, that helped. And you know, I, I, my, it's allowed me to be there in a way where I could educate, but at the education I was doing one-on-one. -on -one. It took more time doing it that way, but instead of being rejected by the system, I've been really embraced. And um, so I think the idea of mentoring uh, privately and interning publicly is a really valuable thing, not just for people who are older, but for people who have authority. Anybody who's in a level of leadership, just know. I mean, it's, it's better to actually, I think in the long run, in terms of building an emotional bank account with someone, to actually have that conversation with them privately when you actually think they're wrong and you have the information and, and the, the wisdom, maybe, to be able to prove it. So, what else? Other questions? Yes, back there, there's a couple. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Emily DeNovo, and I'm an internet researcher at Cowan and Company. Mm -hmm. And I just had a question about um, the instant bookable um, feature on your site and yep. the feedback around that and how you're pushing that. Yeah, so for those who don't understand it, so you can typically, historically, people have been able to uh, book by having a, an ongoing conversation with a host. The instant book feature allows you to just immediately book. Um, and so some people prefer that because it's a lot more efficient. Um, some people actually prefer the back and forth because it allows you to get to know the host a little bit more. Even if you do instant book, you still get to know the host because you book and then you start the conversation. But it, it, it gets you to what you wanted, which was booking faster. We believe that there's more and more need for that. Uh, as we've grown in the business travel space, we see, we see that business travelers absolutely want that. Um, so the percentage of our listings that are instant bookable continues to rise, uh, and you're going to see it rise. But I think we, you know, for, for this, the time being, we're going to continue to have the old school option as well. Last question. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Wiemowski with Street Sense. We do uh, hotel and restaurant development. Uh, one's a comment. Uh, about the wine question, and one's a question. So uh, I stayed at an Airbnb in Hudson, New York with my family uh, this past weekend, and first time I'd ever stayed in one where it had a mini bar for free. So the host yeah. of the house, um, fully stocked bar, nice little note, help yourself, whatever you want, it's all included. So first time I'd ever seen that, so kudos there. Um, you say you're a data company, and just interested in it's known that a, a large portion of your host are professionals that have more than one, two, three, four uh, locations. How are they using? Well, just to be clear, it's not a large percentage. It's actually a very small percentage. So just to, just in terms of data on this, I, I have it. And okay. the AirDNA folks in the world do not have it. So it is a small percentage. So how, how are the professionals versus the couch surfers using that data to become better hosts and grow their business as a as a hospitality provider. Sure. So, yeah, and when I was talking about the, the, the data side of it, it's really more of the Airbnb side. We do give um, information to our hosts so they can actually understand 
you know, what, what's working and what's not, you know, especially related to reviews in terms of giving them feedback. Um, I, you know, when someone's, the, the kind of people who do the professional side of things, there, there's those who are uh, actually taking listings from other people, a primary home, for example, and I have a friend who works for McKinsey as a consultant and is on the road half the time. And then they'll actually work, you know, they'll actually help open that home up for um, guests. So that kind of person who's doing it more professionally is more uh, focused on the demand side, the marketing side, of how do they actually get better search rankings. And once they understand that the search rankings are very much a function of quality, uh, it helps them to understand that they actually have to provide a great hospitality experience in order to actually get better search ranking. And so that's, I think, th I mean, there's a longer answer to give you, and I'm sorry that that's all I've got right now to, to do, but time-wise, but I, what I will say is that the professionals on the site, as long as they're operating from this place of belong anywhere, which is our basic company mission, is to help people belong anywhere, um, you know, in, in most markets, we're fine with them. In some markets, we're less. In San Francisco, for example, the law in San Francisco says it has to be a primary home. So if someone's got multiple units, it better be people's primary homes that they're actually doing that with. They can't do it with secondary homes. Uh, in fact, in San Francisco, you can't do it with a, if you have a second home in San Francisco, you just can't be on any home sharing site. So thank you. That was a lot of information, but I'm glad you joined me.